Hello? Okay, I, I hope everybody had a good lunch break. So, um, welcome to this session. My name is Osma Suominen. Uh, I am uh, from the National Library of Finland. And we have four speakers today. Uh, but first of all, an announcement concerning the lightning talks. So, the lightning talks will be held after the coffee break, after this session. Uh, so, we have uh, eight lightning talks registered. So, every speaker will get four minutes to to talk on their subject, so you know how much you can fit into that. Okay, but the first speaker in this session is uh, Vladimir Alexeyev, um, and he, is, uh, he leads the Data and Ontology Management Group at uh, the Ontotext Corporation from Bulgaria, which is one of the uh, leading semantic technology companies, has been doing this for a long time, and uh, they have about 70 people, and one of their products is the GraphDB um, uh, database, triple store. And uh, he has a PhD in, uh, in computer science from the University of Alberta. And he has done some projects including the uh, research space project with the British Museum and the Yale Center of British Art. And he's also been working with uh, publishing the Getty Trust uh, vocabularies including the art and architecture thesaurus for example as, as linked open data and he has also done several projects for uh, Europeana. But uh, his talk today uh, will be, um, is titled RDF by example, so RDF Pumul for true RDF diagrams and RDF to RML for R to RML generation. What a mouthful. So welcome Vladimir. Introduction. Anyone who attempts to pronounce these abbreviations is uh, quite a brave man. So you see a lot of diagrams in my presentation. You won't be able to read most of them, but uh, in addition to this version, which is a presentation, there's also continuous HTML where the diagrams are much bigger and you can read it at your leisure. I'm sure the organizers will put on the URL for this. It's on GitHub. So the link for this continuous HTML is here. Uh, there is no PDF yet. I see, I'll see I'll pro probably also make a PDF. So um, in my daily work, I do a lot of data modeling for all kinds of domains. You see examples further on. And I've always wanted a good visualization too. I've tried several. And I think that uh, this is very important for RDF modeling because that's a graph data model, right? And I think that the, the people who hold the data, the subject matter experts, the cultural heritage professionals, the librarians, they have to be able to understand it and say whether the mapping is right or not right. So I made a tool that uses plant UML, which itself uses GraphVis. These both are languages where you can define in textual form a diagram. Plant UML is for is used widely in the software industry for doing UML diagrams, just describing them in text. And uh, the benefit of generating diagrams directly from RDF is that they are true. They are they are exactly what you mean in in your model. It's not just hand waving, and you don't need to update them or tweak them. They are all laid out from the RDF. So here's a very simple example. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Turtle, but on top is the Turtle code. You see the last line there is a little instruction. Uh, in this case, it just says that one of the nodes should be displayed in the, in the node where it is referenced instead of being displayed as a separate thing. And you see that the graph is easy to read. It corresponds to the Turtle basically one to one. Everything that I can put in the node is put in the node to save space, to save clutter. Uh, these, are these are called inlines. So the types and RDF literals are inlined, but you can also inline more nodes. This is the generated plant UML. You see that it's not a very complex language. You have arrows there, node names, and so on and so forth. But it can quickly get tricky when you have more features. So. 
because readability is a very important concern for these sort of diagrams. I've done several features. For example, if you have parallel arrows, then I only show one arrow with several labels. If you have several values for the same predicate, then they are collected inside the node with parentheses. Basically, shortcuts that you can also see in Turtle. Um, I also handle reification and similar other specialized kind of things. We'll see them later. So this is an example of arrows uh, that collect the property names. In this case, we have several properties connecting to nodes and to save space we display them this way. This is from CDOC CRM modeling the Getty Kona uh, aggregation of cultural objects. Now uh, we can do a bit with the arrows, for example change the direction. By default the direction goes down but in this case because uh, supposedly this thing on the left which was the motivation for doing the thing on the right happened earlier in time. I just want to put it on the left to emphasize the chronological order. We can also change the uh, shape of the arrow, dashed versus solid and that kind of stuff. We can also put in what are called stereotypes. These are these colored circles plus the guillemetted italicized names on top. So this is from the, the Getty Tesauri. They have different kinds of nodes that are implemented using on one hand scores. On the other hand, this on the bottom comes from the ISO 25964, the latest standard on Tesauri. So here we're just showing G's uh, guide term A's and Tesauri's array. Some particular construct in that mapping we're emphasizing with these circles and stuff. I mentioned reification. Well, the thing here is if you want to say more about the relation, how do you do it? Let's say uh, confidence or uh, provenance of that relation, some date or who created it, things like that. And there is um, something called the provenance, the property reification vocabulary, which basically allows you to describe which properties are used in the reification to address the, the relation and so on. So uh, the two recognizes RDF reification and CDOC CRM reification constructs and displays them like this. So basically the idea is, see this node on the bottom, rather than connecting it with two arrows to the source and to the subject and the object, we just attach it to the relation. And the addressing properties are here on the bottom and they have a little R on the left, on the right and you know this colon showing you, just showing the reader where to look to figure out how it relates to the, the, the arrow. Now we're getting to some more complex diagrams. So this is from uh, the Getty Kona, modeling sources and contributors. You see a rather complex diagram, luckily it's just a tree. We also see here collecting of values, so for example, over here we have more than one value and also comments. So if you want to describe to the reader what this code corresponds to, you can put an RDFS label and it will be shown for an inline note, it will be shown with a comment after a hash sign. Uh, this is another part of the Kona, the Iconographic Authority. It is similar in scope to the icon class that was described in the, in the presentation before the break. And here again, we have reification, we have a custom arrow because has spouse is a bidirectional property, symmetric property, so we show it to the left and without uh, any arrow. Or I did some work for the American Art Collaborative, which is uh, 12 museums in the States trying to map their data to CDOC CRM and establish a demo service. This is an, one alternative of modeling uh, the concept of cast after. So one sculpture is cast, cast after another sculpture from the same mold. Or it could be interpreted as a different sort of network. This is from the Europeana Task Force on FRBROO. And uh, FRBROO is a CDOC CRM extension for bibliographic data. It, if you have four classes in FRBR, you have, I think, about 35 in FRBROO. So here's some works 
after Don Quixote and you know the various connections between them and so on and so forth, a rather complex network. Well, this example is from the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure Project. One of the research problems they're trying to tackle there is to investigate uh, Jewish social networks and how that influence the chance of survival of people. And this is just the model here showing, uh, it uses CIDOC CRM and uh, German National Library's AGRELON. That stands for Agent Relations Ontology to show a network. This is an example from a European project called Multisensor. It dealt with uh, video annotation, uh, news annotation, social network stuff. So it used a bunch of related ontologies for media fragments, open annotation, uh, and also quite in a large way NIF, the NLP interchange format for describing NLP results over text. This is a bit of a model for social network analysis, showing uh, influence and centrality for person in a social network. This is again modeling open annotation and confidence, which comes in another ontology, the Istanbul FISE. Um, here an example of again using these stereotypes. So on the left you have a, an original article in Spanish, these letters SSS, and on the right a translation in English. And you see that with just a bit of control, just saying this translation off should go to the left rather than down, we see very well the parallelism in the two parts of the network. Now, because in multi-sensor, one of the partners also does frame net um, analysis, we devised the way to embed frame net into NIF. This is again generated with plant UML, but not from RDF. It uses plant UML packages to just show the grouping of, of nodes. Now, this here is an actual example of a frame net annotation. And it's not a model. It's generated from actual triples about one sentence. Even though it's totally unreadable to anyone who cannot zoom very deeply into it. And this is only half of that diagram. This is the other half. But it was important for us to see the connectivity of this network and to make sure that the triples we were making were right. I redid one of the examples in the open annotation specification. So you have here blank notes, lists, and interesting kinds of stuff. Um, I proposed to the PCDM people, this is the Portland Common Data Model for a common metadata model for institutional repositories. And over there, the idea is that you use the uh, the circles to designate different types of metadata. It's quite easy to write. This is a handmade diagram from Link TV. We discussed this project before the break. It's about video annotation. And pretty much, pretty much an equivalent thing is in this diagram, which is generated from RDF. And of course, a lot less, uh, a lot less effort to create this one. Uh, this is the model of uh, if you have heard of the International Council of Investigative Journalists, Panama Papers, and now the Bahama Leaks. So we did an RDF rendition of this, and uh, this is sort of the data model that we used. GitHub turns out that it, they have a, they, sh they can show a diff of two images. So as the, pro the model was evolving, on the left you see the old version, and on the right is the new version. Okay, and now in the last, uh, several minutes, I want to talk a bit about can we use these models to generate conversion to RDF? I mean, everybody's data is in different systems. A lot of the data is in relational systems, and the W3C standard for conversion from relational to RML is called R to RML. And yeah, it turns out that if instead of sample values, we use field names. Uh, I made another tool that can generate R to RML conversions out of that. So here is from the Getty Museum a model of exhibitions. And just this node in the middle, uh, it describes a particular sub-exhibition, if you will. An exhibition being at a particular site, in case it's a traveling exhibition. Out of this, we generate R to RML and one node generates about 15, 
because in art to RML you have to be very specific about the subject, the property, the object, every object you have to describe with a separate node and so on. And so what this generator does, he saves you a lot of work and also allows a subject matter expert to inspect the model and guarantees that the transformation will, cons will be consistent with the model. After we feed it this relational data, it produces this actual RDF. The shape of this RDF is pretty much the same as in the model, but because you have two exhibitions over three venues, there's more nodes in it, right? Um, this is a more involved example, the central node of the Getty Museum RDF, which would be the museum object and nodes around it. And so this uh, r 2 rml generation is working well for converting relational sources, but we're also having to deal with XML, with JSON sources. And then the question is, can we extend this? And we're currently working to extend it for other types of input. So there is RML, which is an extension of r 2 rml to deal with JSON and XML. We're currently experimenting with it. There is XSparkle, which is a melding of XQuery and Sparkle. And I think that uh, uh, we might be able to generate XSparkle, or at least a subset of it. For tabular stuff, there is Tarko. And here are just a few models to finish off. So uh, up to now, I've been showing stuff from cultural heritage. But here is things from clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, so we have a rather um, rather elaborate experience with uh, life sciences, things that are important to pharmaceutical companies and so on. And this is a model for just one part of clinical st study results, uh, which basically describes the stati statistical outcome. Lately, I have been working a lot with company data. So this is Dun & Bradstreet data uh, that is mapped to the financial industry business ontology, FIBO. Or this is a legal, identi legal entity identifier. This is a global initiative to make a sort of global trade register, basically to make all of the US funds that created the crash of a few years ago to at least register and to know their uh, shareholding and control structures. And again, mapping this GLAI to FIBO in this model. The difference is that over here we have XML expats and inside the, the nodes are XML fields rather than relational fields. In the further future, we hope to extend this towards RDF shapes. Uh, what you have been seeing here are RDF shapes, but there is a standard for that called Chaco. And I think it's a more modern approach compared to ontologies to describe your semantic data model. And first of all, to be able to visualize RDF shapes, and secondly, to be able to generate them from a more succinct representation, I think can be quite useful. Thanks. Generate some myself. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, thank you for your presentation. Out of curiosity, what uh, visualization did you try first? Uh, just a few names will help. And how scalable are the visualizations? To what degree you can actually fit stuff on your screen and actually still make sense? Um, well, a good example is VOWL. Uh, VOWL can visualize an ontology, and it's integrated in several toolkits for working with ontologies. But um, in order to really be able to read the VL diagram, because you have overlap of the nodes and of the labels, you need to drag them around to review stuff. Uh, before that, there's visualizations that rely on GraphVis, uh, but because they put every node out, and because, for example, they don't use prefixes, don't shorten the node URLs or the, the property URLs, they're very hard to read. As for your second question, it's very important. I think what you've seen here is kind of the maximum you can cram on a screen. But it's not a problem. You don't try to describe a complete mapping of, let's say, 200 fields on one screen. You split it up in four or five screens. 
And then uh, you can just run the generated R2RML files in succession, and they will spit out whatever is needed. I think the maybe the strongest VS2 I've seen is uh, by Allegro Graph. Uh, Graph. I've played with it just a bit. I cannot make it work outside of Allegro Graph. And we being a competitor to Allegro Graph, it doesn't do a, in a good enough job for me. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask one. It wasn't obvious to me. So is the RDF PU mo uh, is it available somewhere so that I could play with it, or is it uh, it's still working? It's still not um, clean enough to put it out, and still we're still wondering whether this is such a, a smart tool that we can make some money out of it, or whether we want to open source it and. It is being used by others in the American Art Collaborative, but uh, yeah, we'll decide this later on. Okay, uh, anyone else? If there are no further questions, then we will thank the speaker. did a really annoying thing and fixed someone's name incorrectly for me, so make sure that that's right first. Um, I, yeah, so I work with metadata at Cornell, and I am here to present on behalf of two of my colleagues that were really excited to get this presentation accepted, but were well, uh, unable to make it to Germany, so they send their apologies. But I'm here presenting the work of uh, Javed, Mohammed Javed, who is a, a, an ontology engineer in semantic uh, applications developer. Sorry, I have my speaker notes here. So, uh, At Cornell University, and then Sandy Payette, who is the Director of IT Research and Scholarship at Cornell University. And we're going to be talking today about visualizing um, scholarly output, the drive of uh, visualization-driven navigation of scholarly data, or the project name is Scholars at Cornell. So we're talking specifically about that. Scholars Cornell is a project at Cornell University where we are hoping to uh, capture and manage, enhance, display, serve up uh, at the scholarly output of Cornell University. We mean this as a whole. It's building off of previous work at Cornell on the Vivo platform, which I'll mention a little bit more in, in a couple of slides. Um, but to really not look so much at just singular faculty profiles, although that's part of it, but to really to have the library help manage and curate and expose scholarly output of the university. And so with that, um, we're sort of in phase one development. Uh, we have a test uh, demo up, which hopefully we will work and we'll see later. Um, but with this phase one development, we're looking to provide high integrity semantic knowledge base, which will then enable exploration and navigation of the scholarly record of Cornell University, um, and then the discovery of expertise, impact, and collaboration, whether existing or um, possible, of, of Cornell faculty and researchers. So that's a lot of words. What, what, what do we mean? Uh, so we're looking to really provide a nice interface to say this is the impact of Cornell's research on the world. Um, we want to grow faculty engagement in this work. So we are Cornell University. We have a Vivo instance. Vivo actually started at Cornell some years ago. Um, Vivo is a researcher profiling system built with Java and linked data in the back. Um, it's had mixed engagement from various uh, departments at Cornell due to just the, the data was, um, there was a lot of duplicates. There was a lot of where is the, does the faculty member update it here, update it there, what's going on with this? And so scholars at Cornell is looking to possibly reboot engagement with faculty members by thinking about faculty curation and ownership from the beginning. Um, they also want it to serve as a data and visualization service um, that is motivated by patterns in data. And the best I can understand uh, of this work is that we're looking for um, improved data algorithms to match and merge many different sources of scholarly description and data about our faculty members. We'll see some of those data sources in a second. Uh, to find patterns and algorithms and 
semi-automated uh, pathways to get that data cleaned up, merged in uh, some sort of format that can work in the platform and then exposed. So it started, um, the Scholars at Cornell pro uh, project has started and really focused on who are the stakeholders, particularly internally for this, this uh, reboot. Um, one of them we think, you know, library, obviously, we have a couple uh, different questions we might ask of this platform. Academic departments is a key uh, internal stakeholder, students, and then the university as a whole. What do we mean by this? Um, well, for library stakeholders, uh, for example, we really want to be able to serve up uh, data and visualizations and information that would answer questions like, well, what journals and resources are faculty members targeting? What are they really using? We know we have that one person that always wants to send you purchase requests for something, but does that really capture what the scholarly output is and where people are, where our researchers are focused? Um, are those resources covered in catalog and repositories? So are we getting appropriate access in some way? Are we purchasing incorrectly? Uh, and what should we prioritize for various uh, efforts, such as open access efforts or preservation initiatives? Uh, for academic departments, it's really a sort of a reporting tool. Uh, they want to know uh, questions, and this academic departments, we mean like deans and department chairs and academic staff. Um, they want to get questions like how many articles are out there, how much research is occurring, where is it being published, how often do we collaborate with other departments, what does that look like. Um, a lot of grant uh, reporting information that's possible in this work, and we'll see some examples of that. And then uh, what research areas are, are being covered or are emerging? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, chemistry is always going to be a chemistry department, but perhaps there's some emerging subdomain within that that we now want to consider getting more faculty for or supporting in some other way. For students, um, and we, scholars is more focused at PhD level and graduate students at this point, but that's not to say it couldn't expand. For students, we're really thinking about how can we help you find experts in research areas, especially when, when there's so much cross-departmental and cross-discipline um, work going on now. How can you find someone who might be interested in a particular subset? Ask them to be your supervisor, hopefully. Um, and also look at various emerging scholarly out areas and find articles on it. And we're focusing very much on articles in phase one, so you'll see that quite a bit. For the university, we want to know, and I've said this pretty much before, what do we, we want to know what the high impact areas of Cornell work are and what our global impact is, any emerging trends, and, and collaboration opportunities. So with that background, we get a little bit into what data goes into this system, what is scholars, and what, what data can we leverage within it. Scholars at Cornell right now pulls data from a couple different sources. We have our existing Vivo production instance, which we're looking at to see if we can possibly pull and leverage some data from that. Um, Vivo, again, is our faculty profiling researcher system. It's got some data in it. Can we pull that? Can we clean it up? Can we get it usable for this new system? Um, we definitely are looking at, are pulling stuff from OSP, is Office of Sponsored Research at Cornell University. They give us all their grant data, so we can pull that in and merge it and have information about that in the system. Uh, we pull information from human resources. This is where we really capture all of the dar departmental affiliations and status of our faculty members and researchers. Um, we pull information from the registrar to see what kind of course loads are occurring or, or that sort of output. And then at the core of Scholars at Cornell is going to be the symplectic elements feeding into a new Vivo instance. And we're looking at symplectic elements for this to manage all of the various streams of data and to help with merging, but also be an access point for faculty members to uh, own articles so they can go in and say, yes, that's my article. Yes, this is me. Because often you, we all have seen where articles have, you know, Smith JS as the, the article or the author name. And is that this person here? Well, you know, you'd be surprised how many Smith JSs there are in like a particular uh, work area. So, symplectic elements serve, uh, serves in that way, and then we serve that up to scholars, which is another Vivo instance. This is a slightly uh, different diagram that shows a little bit more how the data gets pushed back and forth. Um, you can see that uh, hand creation. Um, we, we have uh, uh, symplectic elements, which is elements 5.0, really serving as that linchpin. 
for data refinement cleaning, uh, access point for faculty members to self-curate, and then it goes into a cache and feeds into scholars. Um, the only data I'm aware of, and I, I would need to conf uh, have this confirmed, that doesn't go through that elements uh, section right now would be the HR data, which is where we say this is the person's name and their affiliation within the college and that sort of, inf uh, that sort of information. And that does get eventually pushed back to elements. So this is a slightly different view on that data structure. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, and what happens with this structure is after elements, what gets cached and then pushed to scholars is what we're calling an Uber record. Um, it's basically where we've merged all these sources and made a record that can then serve uh, as clean, curated, accessible data in scholars. So this Uber record is we, we take information from Web of Science, which we're particularly heavily using in this, um, this test instance, that gets pulled into symplectic elements, gets curated by faculty members. We take information from the um, HR records that are coming in. We directly query the Oracle database behind a couple different campus systems to get information about grants or teaching efforts or whatever. Have that go into that Uber record and then push that into scholars. This is just the start of a sample Uber record because, you know, since I was talking about it, um, not particularly exciting except for it is clean data going into a system. It's aggregated. Um, so you can see here a little bit of what's going on. If you want to see a full one, I can pull a sample full one for you. But it's, it's not really the heart of this. What the heart of this is, in my opinion, and for this conference, Scholars is building very much off the Vivo model and ontologies. So you can see here, this is in the, the modeling for um, one of the people, persons, that would be managed in scholars and that would have connected to it eventually grants, departments, uh, research outputs, articles, which we all would then also manage in uh, scholars. So you can see we have both person, we have information that comes from the HR department that gets asserted on it, it gets related to positions, which we would manage from the HR data as well, and then we would start to apply more information according to these other data sources. Like this, um, this is where we, so this is relatively simple, but actually has been quite powerful for the visualizations we're going to see. This is where we have a person who is the author of an article, from the article data that we get from Web of Science or elsewhere, but primarily Web of Science right now, we get the journal name. From the journal name, we get any sort of subject assignments. We then have inferred these subject assignments attached back to both the article and the person. Not perfect, but it gets us a place to start with visualizing this data. And this doesn't indicate expertise. It just indicates that they've written something on this topic. So the partnerships with Cornell have been, are, with the faculty are extremely important for this process to work. Um, it means that they need to go in and check and harvest and, and curate and look at it and really take part in building their own scholarly um, portfolio. Now I'm gonna um, test the fates and see if I can show you something on the site. And if it fails, don't worry, I took screenshots because internet failing at a library technology conference is a bylaw at this point. Nope, that's not what I want. Sorry, I just showed someone else's. Um, so this is the homepage for scholars at Cornell. You can see, uh, if we scroll down, uh, we've got a couple different entry points for how you might start accessing the data captured here. Um, you can go in and start looking around uh, according to, well, I'm gonna skip this. because I, What I really wanna show you is these are the types of visualizations all built with D3 that are pulled in from that Uber record data that goes into this system and it is managed underneath with all of the data modeling and such we saw before. Um, you could see we've got, uh, keyword clouds are just ubiquitous now, but we've got those, we can figure out collaborations. Research grants have been a really interesting thing to sort of harvest and play with that data to see what's going on. And person to subject area, which we're going to look at, but I want to first, Go, find, go dig into academic units so you can see what it looks like. Uh, we've got quite a few different academic units, some of which you, you know, might argue aren't necessarily that, but we've got those here that you can start to navigate through. Um, I'm gonna go to college, and this has primarily the College of Engineering data in it right now because the scholars team has been partnering with them quite closely as a test case. It's working okay so far, thank God. We've got departments underneath, 
And for each de department or unit, you could have visualization at that level as well. But I'm going to drill down. Here we've got faculty members. Now let's see if this will work for us. This should be a visualization of all the faculty members at Cornell or in that Meinig School of Biomedical Engineering. Faculty members are in the middle. And then those subject assignments that we were talking about get out here on the edge. So if I was to click on one person, he becomes a center all of a sudden. I can see what he's been working on. That's, that's the topic. Let me see if we can go back. You can reach over. And then what pops out are other people that have also worked on that topic. You can sort of dig into this, play around with it as much as you like. Um, but if I click on the faculty members page, you see we get a page in scholars for this person, which also means we have a URI that we manage for this person. Um, and one of the things we're doing with the scholars going forward is to make sure that those URIs are persistent so that other universities can continue to query it, but indicate if a faculty member is no longer at Cornell. Uh, the other thing I want to show really quickly, oh, I've got to get back. Oh, come on, please. Okay. So if we are back in engineering, I'm going to go back to my next school because I know that one works for me. Something else you could sort of look at, if it can come up, and it's going to take a second to load. These are the grants that are associated with that department vis-a-vis -vis the faculty member information. Uh, if you hover over it, you see the name for the grant. You can click on it, get more information, click on the grant. And we have another record in Scholars as well as a URI for that particular grant application. And we have that linked to the faculty members through <clears throat> through that HR data. Um, one final thing <clears throat> I would like to show, if I can get it to work, uh, is the uh, possibility for collaboration. Let me go back. So we do want to support people collaborating. This shows how many times someone from a particular department has collaborated with someone else in a particular other department at Cornell. Um, we've got engineering department in the middle. You've got the, the high level. Uh, code names pulled from um, uh, H or Cornell organizational data for the departments. And then you've got further on, like sub-departments sub or units within it. You can hover over and see how many projects or something they collaborated on together. Click on that. You get a new visualization where you have the people in their department and what they were up to. So this is meant to help support both showing how we're interacting with each other at Cornell, but one of the phase two goals for this is to actually extend it to have it show collaborations with other universities as well. Um, so let me go back to PowerPoint. So luckily the demo worked. Yes. <laughs> That's all I wanted, so now I can you know, die happy. But, um, Going through the screenshots, there are screenshots in there in case. Uh, exposing data going forward, um, we don't have a Sparkle endpoint at present, but built into Vitro and Vivo um, are uh, a, a variety of APIs, and so that's something that is actively being developed. Um, we do want other universities to start seeing that they can use this data, the context of Cornell's scholarly output. Maybe Harvard wants to see it and see like how it compares or what's going on. That's, that's something we're actively thinking about building out. Um, and like I mentioned before, we're keeping those URIs now in per, uh, perpetuity, where we did not with uh, the previous Vivo. If they left Cornell, we basically no longer manage the URI. So if you want to know more about this presentation, you should really contact um, Javed, because he's brilliant, and he's the guy behind especially all of the visualizations. That's his email right there. Um, thank you for dealing with me presenting his work, and I appreciate y'all's attention. Actually, <clears throat> before I ask the question, I wanted to ask your very last remark, you know, ring the bell for me. Oh, yeah. Which said that, <laughs> well, not necessarily in a good sense. Oh, okay. That ah. You say that if somebody leaves Cornell, then his or her URI is not managed anymore? Absolutely. So what I can tell you about that, and this is something I can speak authoritatively about, so thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the things we tried to do at Cornell was pull URIs for faculty members into our MARC records leveraging the subfield zero. That's an entirely separate project, but it's a context for the answer I'm giving you. 
Um, we would want to pull that in particularly for dissertations so that we could have an identifier for that faculty member and we ne don't necessarily have an ORCID ID or a name authority file record from Library of Congress. When I started running that reconciliation process and trying to do some updating and some entity resolution stuff, I all of a sudden got a bunch of 404s <laughs> and was like, what? what is going on? And that's where I uncovered that there was sort of a evolving process over time of the, the data was still stored somewhere, but the URIs were no longer exposed. And we were like, this, this, is, <laughs> this is a problem for our, our workflows in particular, but hey, could you reconsider that decision? Um, with scholars, they're saying, yes, that, that's, that is no longer going to be the case. Okay, it will not be. So they're, good. Yep. That, that, good. S sorry for the long story, but yeah, no, okay. that's the that's, context that's great. of it. That's great. Um, now, yeah. my original question, I'm sorry, because this yeah, is just course. triggered here. Um, how should I put it? So how much of that is Cornell specific? It, it's entirely uh, Cornell specific right ah, now. So comes the standardization person. What I would like to see if I do a scholarly publication, mm -hmm. okay, and I can convince at last my publisher that he, they would put up proper metadata for journals and authors, etc. Mm -hmm. I would like that data to be in such a format that you could use it directly. So I want that type yeah. of metadata to be standardized enough that the scholarly community as a whole, Cornell included, could use it, could so, use it yeah. rather than having right. isolated yeah. silos. Absolutely, absolutely. My response to that would be twofold. Um, the actual model of the RDF data exposed to scholars is based off Vivo. And so that is a community ontology that we're extending and hopefully that can get wrapped in or who, who knows. So that, that's all uh, reuse where possible and clear modeling. For those Uber records, there's such an internal process for the merging and loading that I don't even know if we would want to expose those necessarily or just make sure we expose that really nice RDF data that comes out of the system. Uh, you know, everything probably not, but as much as possible should be general and not bound to a university, however great university So you have a, a metadata person giving a presentation for a couple of programmers. Yeah, it should be generalized and it should follow standards, absolutely. Okay, any other questions? Come on. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe not a question, but a comment continuing to what you said. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Springer Nature are now publishing a gob of information on their journals and articles and so on in, the, in a project called SciGraph. And for now, they've selected not to reuse anything to make their mm. own ontology. I've spoken to them a couple of times. It, there are pros and cons to this. Mm -hmm. The big question is how established is Vivo and how well it covers the universe of science. Because before Vivo, there was Serif here in Europe. Okay, it's an XML model, but a very general model of relations between things, very generic thing. And a few years ago, there were attempts to RDFSize it. My understanding is that Serif is the foundation of current research information systems in Europe on a mass scale. It's also the data model behind Open Air, the European mm -hmm. uh, articles, the Euro portal for articles produced by Horizon 2020 and before that, FP7. So um, I think that a lot of data modeling for this domain is kind of already done, but there just needs to be more coming together, especially between the states and Europe, I think. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'd be interested to help support any collaborations between us and others that would, these two in the front seem like you're particularly interested, but like we can, we can see what we can do together going forward. I would also say that the, the real force of scholars right now is not necessarily as much remodeling in the back as trying to figure out our priorities for what this, this application is meant to serve, and then having that data exposed so that reporting like, and visualizations can happen. Actually, just a remark on that. I may be mistaken, sorry if it's the case, but I think that there is a bibliography work done at schema.org. There is. Which may be you know, a way to 
standardize it and not make it dependent. So right now, scholars focuses on article data and data we can pull from Web of Science. Phase two definitely has within scope monographs and books. And what that's going to pull in is other projects at Cornell that are already looking at RDF modeling of that, um, in particular LD4L, which we'll be hearing about tomorrow from another very brilliant speaker. <laughs> okay, uh, there's one question here. Yes, um, we got the first question via Twitter. Yeah. Oh, yay! I, yeah, I invite anybody <laughs> watching the live stream to ask another question. So I will just read this out. Uh, it's by Christian Hauschke from T, uh, TEB currently, I think. Uh, can the person take their profile with them when they leave, for example, via an ORCID synchronization? They could definitely export the data and pull it along. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if so taking the data, sure, um, their profile style staying up, I, I would presume so, but there will be some sort of indication on it that this is no longer a faculty member at Cornell, and we wouldn't still be collecting more information about them because they would no longer be in the HR systems or something like that. Um, it'd be an interesting comment or work area to see how we could, say if they moved to Harvard and they had something similar, how we could link those two. Still more? Just one short question. Uh, is this demo system uh, open uh, for everybody to, to have a look? Um, I believe so, and I'll triple check. The GitHub link is public. Um, I know it's on GitHub. I have to confirm that it's open, and then we can see. No, just this. Um, it's closed, now. Uh, so it's closed now. Okay, so we'll see if we can share it in some way. It, yeah. Okay, would be great. It's really mm -hmm. great browse. It's great work by someone who's not me, so I, I hesitate to comment on, on the openness of their code, but I don't see why we couldn't. <laughs> so, uh, but as I understood, so the, the website is open. It, uh... Oh, no, the, <laughs> the website is a demo, and we're still figuring out the kinks, so you'll be asked for a password if you just like, sneakily copied that URL from my browser, and I apologize for that. Oh, okay. Okay, I think we have for, uh, time for one more question. Uh, how do you cope with, uh, I would say, flux in your organizatorial data? I mean, the chair X uh, moves to the institute and the institute is moved to a different department. Uh, Professor A wrote a paper with Professor B. B wasn't at Cornell then, but he is mm -hmm. now the here. But the professor. They're a visiting fellow, they yeah. change their title, yeah, they get a special chair. No. Um, so I would imagine with. So like I said, that this is a demo. And when I say that, again, it's because it's a demo tightly coupled with their partnership with the College of Engineering. And so I imagine at this point, they're just trying to figure out what kind of uh, visualizations resource data would be helpful for them. But something I know that has been broached and, and hopefully would be talked about going forward is handling just organizational structure within the College of Engineering. So a lot of our HR data is what guides things like this is the subunit or this is a unit in this college, but as we all know, there's probably that one random unit that someone started over there that's not really associated with anything, but it's kind of at Cornell. What is that relationship? There's shifts in people's reporting lines. Hopefully this is something we're looking at. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Thanks, everyone.